Hi everybody, it's Chris Moroski, and we are going to review fetal heart rate tracings in this video. So let's just quickly do a review of the video that you had watched from APCO, and just make sure everybody's on the same page. So a normal baseline for a fetal heart rate is between 110 to 160 beats per minute. When you are reporting the baseline, which is what you should report first, um, you're going to want to do this in increments of 5. So something like the fetal heart rate baseline is 125, or the fetal heart rate baseline is 140. So you're going to do it in increments of 5. Just to review, uh, fetal heart rate variability. Absent variability is no wiggle whatsoever, no amplitude, so a 0 beats per minute. Minimal variability is 1 to 5 beats per minute. Moderate variability is 6 to 25 beats per minute. So this is normal, and this is the widest range. And so if you're ever put in the spot and you're not sure what to say, usually if it's a medical student doing a report to us, the baby has to be okay or else we're going to be doing something about it. So you can usually just guess moderate. And last we have marked variability. Marked is when there's greater than 25 beats per minute. Um, you would kind of think that going from absent to middle minimal to moderate would you know increasingly go towards normal and that marked would be the best turns out it's not true marked is usually when something really big and dramatic has happened to the baby and they'll have a lot of swing of their baseline uh, variability and so marked isn't always a normal thing it usually is something uh, that's really shaking the baby up all right moving on from baseline and variability uh, the next thing you're going to want to present to us when doing your presentations is accelerations now, accelerations are, either, are sort of, think of them as like yes or no. They're either present or absent, okay? You don't describe them any other than that. Just accelerations are present, accelerations are absent. Um, the way we define accelerations has to do with the week's gestational age. So uh, a baby over 32 weeks, or greater than or equal to 32 weeks, um, will need an increase of 15 beats per minute over the baseline with the acceleration lasting for a total of 15 seconds to be considered an acceleration. And it's and importantly, it's not the peak that needs to last for 15 seconds. The peak just needs to hit 15 beats per minute over the baseline, and then the whole hump that is the acceleration needs to last for 15 seconds. Um, if a fetus is less than 32 weeks, then we're a little less strict. So it needs to be increase of 10 beats per minute over the baseline, and the acceleration needs to last more than 10 seconds, 10 seconds or more, to count as an acceleration to say, yes, they are present. Um, one thing that wasn't touched on in the APCO video is, that, uh, is the term reactive. Reactive is a perfect baby. A reactive baby will have two accelerations present in a 20-minute period. Um, this we use during non-stress tests um, and when we're keeping an eye on babies uh, on labor and delivery for prolonged monitoring. Um, if they are reactive, we know that that baby should do very well. It predicts their long-term survival over the course of a week um, very well. So it's an important term to know, reactive. Okay, and then decelerations. And decelerations get a lot of attention on labor and delivery. So it's going to be important that you sort of sit down and understand these concepts um, of the different types of decelerations. An early deceleration is when there is head compression. And so importantly, the deceleration is going to be timed with the contraction. These are totally fine. Unlike the other decelerations that imply uh, a loss of oxygen exchange to the baby, this is not true for early decelerations. This is just a reflex that happens when the head is compressed. This actually usually is when the baby is close to um, delivering. And so this is a very good thing to see. On the other end of the spectrum are late decelerations. Late decelerations imply utero-placental insufficiency. Um, you will see that the deceleration starts to go down um, sort of at the peak or after the contraction, and certainly they do not recover until the contraction is well over. Um, these aren't always good. In fact, sometimes they are bad, especially if they are persistent. So late decelerations um, are, are something that always gets our attention. Very, variable decelerations are very obvious. Variable decelerations are caused by cord compression, um, and these actually have nothing to do with the timing. So a variable can happen at any time. It can happen before a contraction, during a contraction, 
after a contraction, in the absence of contractions, as long as that cord is being compressed. The way you can tell it is a variable, it has an abrupt onset, an abrupt recovery, and variable decelerations tend to look like the letters V, U, and W. Last but not least, a prolonged deceleration. This also wasn't covered in the APCO video. A prolonged deceleration is when the heart rate drops for more than 2 minutes, but no longer than 10 minutes. Um, and this usually happens following a series of variable or late decelerations. And so those two types of decelerations imply oxygen not getting to the baby. And after enough time, the baby's going to like be trying to catch its breath. <sighs> And that's what a prolonged deceleration is. It usually implies that something significant has happened to the baby in terms of oxygen exchange. Um, circling back to the time frame, if the um, heart rate goes down more than 10 minutes, um, we call that a baseline change and not a prolonged deceleration. So those are the four types of decelerations, early, late, variable, and prolonged. All right, and then um, just to wrap up this review with a sinusoidal pattern, um, this is very ominous. It is not good. This is when the baby bleeds out all of its blood, basically. Um, you'll see this with uh, ruptured vasa previa or with fetal maternal hemorrhage, like after a car accident or other kinds of trauma, where the baby bleeds its blood volume into the mom's blood volume. Um, also, you'll see this in isoimmunized babies. So it's a sign of profound anemia in the baby. Um, I've actually never seen this. Uh, what's more common is something called a pseudosinusoidal pattern, which has a higher um, frequency uh, than, a, than the true sinusoidal pattern. We can see this with certain medications. And then also very interestingly, when the babies are sucking on their thumbs, we'll see a pseudosinusoidal pattern. That's more common. You may come across that. Okay, now with that brief review over, what I want to do is I'm going to go over 12 different cases so I'm going to give you a clinical presentation. Then I'm going to show you a blank version of the fetal heart rate tracing that would be associated with that case. I want you to think about how you would read that. And again, your presentation should be baseline, variability, accelerations present or absent, decelerations present or absent, and the type of decelerations. And then if you're getting very, very advanced at this, you'd want to give the category. Category 1, 2, or 3. So after a brief second to think about the tracing, I'll give you Chris Morosky's answer to the fetal heart rate tracing. All right, so we've got 12 cases. Let's go through them. The first case is a woman in labor. She is contracting with mesoprostol for cervical ripening. The baby is tolerating this well and is reactive. So here is what that fetal heart rate tracing would look like. You can see the contractions on the bottom. And then you can see the fetal heart rate in the, in the top. So how would you read this fetal heart rate tracing? My read of this fetal heart rate tracing is as follows. The fetal heart rate tracing is a baseline of 120s. There is moderate variability. Accelerations are present. There are negative decelerations. That would make this a category one fetal heart rate tracing. Okay, patient number two. A woman is in labor. She is contracting on oxytocin. There is a nuchal cord times two around the baby's neck. What type of tracing or decelerations would you expect in this scenario? Here is the fetal heart rate tracing for patient number two. How would you read this tracing? My read of this tracing is as follows. The fetal heart rate tracing is a baseline of 140s. There is moderate variability. Accelerations are present. There are positive recurrent variable decelerations. And that would make this a category 2 tracing. Case number 3. A woman is in labor. She is contracting on her own. There is chorioamnionitis, or an infection of the amniotic fluid and membranes, with fetal distress. This is the fetal heart rate tracing for patient number three. How would you read this tracing? My read of this tracing is a fetal heart rate of baseline 180s, minimal variability, no accelerations, 
positive recurrent late decelerations, and that would make this category 2 to 3. In the setting of chorioamnionitis, there's usually a fever and maternal tachycardia. The baby also will have tachycardia in the setting of fever, and these recurrent late decelerations are letting us know that that infection is starting to interfere with the exchange of oxygen through the placenta. So this baby's either going to have to deliver real soon, vaginally, or a C-section would be required. Patient number four is a woman in labor contracting on oxytocin. She is 10 centimeters dilated with plus four fetal station and almost about to push. What would you expect for her fetal heart rate tracing? Here is patient four's fetal heart rate tracing. This one's a little more tricky. Again, look for the baseline first. The baseline is where the fetal heart rate tracing spends most of its time during a 10 minute period. My read of the fetal heart rate tracing for patient number four is baseline 130s, moderate variability, accelerations are present, and there are positive recurrent early decelerations. This is category one. And those early decelerations would be consistent with head compression from the head being so low and the patient just about to push. Patient number five is a woman in labor contracting on her own. There is a variable deceleration eventually leading to fetal distress. Here is her fetal heart rate tracing, which is a little bit more complicated. How would you read this fetal heart rate tracing? My read of this fetal heart rate tracing is a baseline of 150s with minimal variability. There are negative accelerations. There is a positive variable deceleration followed by a prolonged deceleration. This is a category two tracing. And you can see that that prolonged deceleration does go down similar to a variable deceleration, but it lasts from about two and a half to three minutes. That's what makes it a prolonged deceleration. Patient number six is a woman in labor and she's contracting on her own. She has new onset maternal hypotension following an epidural placement. She has a term baby that is tolerating the hypotension to some degree. Here's the fetal heart rate tracing for patient number six. How would you read this tracing? My read of this tracing for patient number six is a baseline of 120s. There's moderate variability, accelerations are present, and there are positive recurrent late decelerations. This is a category two tracing. So you can see the late decelerations after every contraction. You can also see the two accelerations, one in the middle and one to the right of the tracing. Patient number seven is a woman with preeclampsia who is on IV magnesium sulfate and she received IV dilaudid for her headache. She's not in labor and the fetus is tolerating this overall pretty well. Here's the fetal heart rate tracing for patient number seven. How would you read this tracing? Keep in mind she's on magnesium and dilaudid IV, both of which get to the baby. My read of the tracing for patient number seven is a baseline of 135s, minimal variability, no accelerations, no decelerations. This is a category two tracing. And again, the dilaudid and magnesium are probably making that baby feel pretty blah. The baby's probably not moving around a lot. And so there's real no change in the heart rate, but the baseline is normal. Patient number eight is a woman who is not in labor and she is on supra-therapeutic doses of digoxin for maternal paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, which the doctors are trying to convert. So she's on a lot of digoxin. This also can get to the baby. Here is the fetal heart rate tracing. How would you read this fetal heart rate tracing? My read of the fetal heart rate tracing for patient number eight is a baseline of 90s. There is minimal variability, accelerations are absent, decelerations are absent, and this is category two to three. The reason it's category two to three as opposed to the previous patient on magnesium and dilaudid is that the baseline is below normal in the 90s. 
Patient number 9 is a woman in labor who undergoes artificial rupture of membranes. This is followed by a large gush of bright red blood from an unknown vasa previa. What would this fetal heart rate tracing look like? Here is patient number 9's fetal heart rate tracing. The ARAM is labeled in the middle of the fetal heart rate tracing. How would you read this tracing? My read of patient number 9's tracing would be a baseline of 125s, moderate variability with an acceleration prior to artificial rupture of membranes. Following ARAM, there is a prolonged deceleration leading to an ominous sinusoidal pattern. This is category 3. This baby would need to be delivered immediately to save its life. Patient number 10 is a woman not in labor who presents for her non-stress test for gestational diabetes at 36 weeks. Her non-stress test is reactive, which is reassuring for the fetal status. What would her fetal heart rate tracing look like? This is patient number 10's fetal heart rate tracing. How would you read this tracing? My read of this tracing is a baseline of 140s, moderate variability, positive accelerations, negative decelerations, this is category 1, and also it is reactive. All right, moving on to patient number 11. This is a woman who is in labor who dilates very quickly from 3 to 9 centimeters, and the baby is appropriately and significantly stimulated by the rapid change. What would you expect to see in this fetal heart rate tracing? Here's patient number 11's fetal heart rate tracing. How would you read this tracing? My read of this fetal heart rate tracing is a baseline of 120s, there is initially moderate, followed by marked variability. Accelerations are present. Decelerations are absent. That would make this category 2. And you can really see the abrupt change in the fetus right there, going from 3 to 9 centimeters, and all of a sudden getting very stimulated and having this marked variability. Again, this isn't concerning, but definitely this was a surprise to the baby, and you can see this here. And our last patient, patient number 12, is a woman in labor with a prior cesarean section and a ruptured uterus where the fetus begins to leave the uterine cavity and enter the peritoneal cavity. This can't be good. What would this fetal heart rate tracing look like? Here is patient 12's fetal heart rate tracing. How would you read this tracing? My read of patient 12's fetal heart rate tracing is a baseline of 150s with eventually minimal variability, accelerations absent, and a prolonged deceleration. And as you can imagine, as this baby is making its way into the abdomen, it's completely not getting any oxygen. This is not a good place for a baby. And you can see off to the far right of the fetal heart rate tracing that the heart rate is beginning to not be able to get picked up. And this is an absolute emergency for this baby in the setting of a ruptured uterus. All right, everybody, that is the end of our fetal heart rate tracing review. I hope you found this helpful. Good luck reading fetal heart rate tracings. You're going to be experts in no time. This is definitely something that you can pick up quickly and ask us to um, go over these fetal heart rate tracings on labor and delivery. They're always there, and there's always some learning to be had from going over them. All right, good luck, and see you soon. Bye-bye.